Perfect. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another live community classroom with Michaels. We have our friend Tamara Kelly from Moogly blog with us today, and we're going to be learning how to make a beginner crochet blanket using Bernat Blanket Ogo. My name is Renee L from Your Inspirations, and I'll be helping with any questions you might have during today's class. So please feel free to drop your questions in the chat and we'll make sure that Tamara answers them. While we're getting ready to kick things off, let us know where you're watching from or who you want to make this blanket for or if it's for yourself. Awesome. Over to you, Tamara. Okay, great. Hi, everybody. As she said, I'm Tamara Kelly from Moogly, and I am here today to show you how to crochet this gorgeous blanket right here. This is called, it's got a little bit of a long name, the Bernat Touch of Texture Crochet Blanket. You can see right here, this is a really gorgeous blanket made in stripes. It is made with what is most commonly called the moss stitch or the linen stitch. Actually has lots of names in crochet, so that's why we're going to teach it today. And then it's got this really great reverse single crochet edging. This is one of my favorite edgings to add to all sorts of projects. And I'm going to show you not only how to crochet this edging, but a great alternative that I think is even easier, but gives a really similar look. So to make this pattern, you're going to be using two colors of Bernat Blanket Ogos. So if you haven't used them before, I'm gonna be showing you how to open those up today, but that is, this is what they look like right here. This is our Bernat Blanket Ogos. It's just the Bernat Blanket you know and love, um, just wrapped up a little differently. So I'm gonna show you how, how to open these up. Now, the great thing about these Ogos is that they're designed to be used in two different ways. You can break it and make it, which means take the different colors apart, or you can just go with the flow and crochet or knit, whatever you're making, right on through the skein. And that's what we're going to be doing today. In addition to the yarn, of course, you need a crochet hook. And this one calls for a US N15 10 millimeter, a great big book, great big hook like you can see here. This one's by Susan Bates. It's got a bamboo handle, which I love. Now, they should have dropped the pattern for you in the chat if you haven't gotten it already. It's available for free on yarnspirations.com. And let's go ahead and move in our hand camera and we'll take apart our Ogos. Let's see here, we've got two of them to take apart today and I wanted to make sure that you guys can see just how they come apart in case you haven't worked with these before. So I've got the two colors right here. And for this pattern, we're gonna start at one end and just crochet right through. We don't need to take them apart color wise we just need to take apart our skeins my hook wants to keep rolling away so i had to kind of fuss with that for a minute now let's see did my scissors wander off there we are okay that is the other supplies you need is a pair of scissors to open these up first things first we pull off the paper and then we come right down here to the bottom this is the section that the paper was covering you can see there's already an end right there waiting for us so we can pull these two ends apart right here I'm going to get really nice and close. What we want to find, I'm putting my fingers right in this game there so I can feel for it, is that little plastic tab right there. Can you guys see that right there on camera? That's a little plastic tab that's holding this fastener cord together. And what we want to do is hold on to that while we cut this cord with our scissors. There we are. It's kind of hard to show because you got to keep your hands on it. But we just give that a little snip and then we can pull that cord. Hard to see, but it's there. Tiny little cord pull it right on out of the skein, and then we are ready to go ahead and start crocheting. You wanna pull from the outside, so whichever one, whichever end is pulling from the outside, that's where you can begin for this pattern. So we need to do that for both of our skeins because we're going to be crocheting with both of these at the same time. So we'll take apart this Ogo as well, same thing. Come down here where they get real thin. I kind of think of these little croissants of yarn. Pull those two bottom colors apart. There's that little plastic tab. Always seems to be off to the right for me. I don't know why. Just where it seems to land. There it is. So I'm gonna hold on to that while I snip the cord again. Pull it right on out. And now we can find the end that's on the outside and we're ready to start crocheting with this one as well. So let's come over to our written pattern here. Again, this is the Touch of Texture Crochet Blanket and when you work with Ogo, sometimes you'll see the different colors labeled. These aren't labeled because, again, we're just going to start at one end and crochet right through. We don't have to worry about specific colors for this. This blanket that it makes is approximately 50 inches by 60 inches. And the big thing that I want to point out right here is that the stripe pattern is listed out separately from the written pattern for the blanket. The way the stripe pattern, wor pattern rather works 
Is it with color A, you work two rows, then with B, two rows, then A, two rows, then B, two rows, back and forth. So they haven't included the color change information in the written pattern. It's all right here. So just keep that in mind. You're going to be carrying your yarn up along one side of the blanket, and I'll be demoing that here in just a moment. The other thing I wanted to point out, though, on the written pattern is it starts with a chain of 76, which is a multiple of two chains. That means you can start this blanket with any multiple of two, any even number. So today we're going to be making a small swatch, not a full size blanket, not in an hour. Um, but if you wanted to change the size of the blanket, make it a baby blanket, make it a lap blanket, maybe even a king size throw, then you can just um, go ahead and make that chain as long as you want your blanket to be wide. Just make sure you have an even number and you'll be all set to start crocheting. So let's go ahead and get started together. Now, the way this is written, our agave colorway, the blues here is our color A. So I want to go ahead and find the end of my yarn here and my crochet hook, which I set aside, and pull that right up here to our table. And so for our little, our little swatch today, I think I'm going to go ahead and start with a chain of around probably 16 or so. We'll see what looks good here as we start crocheting. So as I start making our chain, I've got a slip knot on the hook, and I'm just going to start chaining some here. I'm not going to go all the way to 76. But while I do that, Renee, are there any questions about getting started with this pattern? Nothing so far. Um, okay. It's a little quiet. Um, if anyone can direct message either me or Milan and just let us know that your chat's working. Okay. Yeah. And also chime in and tell us where you're uh, watching from. I always love to hear where people are watching from. All around How warm the or world. cold is it? <laughs> All right. I just got a direct message from Veronica. They want to know how do I start the chain? Okay. Well, let's go back to that then because I haven't gotten that far and these this part's pretty quick. So what you want to do is start with a slip knot. So we're going to take the end of our yarn. This is a thick yarn, so we're going to come a fair ways in, um, eight inches or so. You know, you don't have to measure it or anything. Make a loop with your yarn. Pull that tail end behind the loop. Let me get that a little better centered right there. Then I'm just going to slip my hook right under that loop and pull down on those ends. And that creates a slip knot. And after that, we're going to start chaining. So to chain, we yarn over, which means we come over our hook from the top or from the back there and use our hook to pull that loop through the loop that's on our hook. And then we just keep going. You want to make sure that these loops are pretty big, give them a little yank because this is a textured yarn and it can be very easy to work very closely and tightly with this yarn. And we need to work back into these chains. So we don't want our chains to be tight. Um, if you are looking for a learn how to crochet class, then there are some really great ones available on the Michaels YouTube channel. Um, Renee, maybe you could drop one or two of those in the chat. Absolutely. But this is chaining right here because, you know, we want to we want to get to the pattern. We don't want to just teach how to crochet and we've only got an hour. So there we go. This is a chain. So we have our chain made. You can see there's two loops on the top here and one loop on the bottom underneath. When you work back into the chain, um, if you're an experienced crocheter, you can work into whichever part of the chain you like. Personally, I like to work into this hump on the back. But again, just want to be consistent as you work back into the chain. So I'm going to add a couple more here and then I'm going to count and see if I actually have an even number or not for our little swatch. Let's see. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Oop, got a little twisted there. Let me try that again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Yep. And one more makes twelve. So we'll start with twelve chains right there. So we've got a slip knot on our hook. I'm going to chain 12 for our little swatch. If you want to make the full size blanket as written, you would need a chain of 76. So after that, we're ready to begin the first row. And as I said, I'm going to be working into that back hump of the chain, but you can work into whichever portion of the chain you like. What we want to do, though, is make sure that we skip the chain closest to the hook. That's going to be our turning chain, the little ladder that gives us the height for our row that we're about to make. And then we go into the second chain. So I'm just going to flip mine over and insert my hook right into that back hump. Yarn over and pull through and make a single crochet. 
right there in the second chain from the hook. Then our pattern repeat begins. So if you're following along with the written pattern, this is the part that starts with the asterisk. From here, we chain one, skip the next chain, and there it is, skip the next chain and single crochet in the chain after that. Just like that. So now we've got a chain one, skip one, single crochet in the stitch after that. Do it again. Chain one, skip one, single crochet in the stitch after that. Chain one, skip one, single crochet in the stitch after that. Chain one. Get your chain straightened out here. They do like to twirl up on you here. There we are. Skip one and single crochet in the chain after that. And then chain one, skip one, and single crochet in that very last chain. Now, if you find that you single crochet and you've got, still got a chain left, that means either you started with an odd number or you missed one or you skipped too many. So you need to go back and just make sure that you've skipped a chain in between each of those single crochets. That's about what it should look like at the end of row one. So if you were making the full size blanket, you'd have 75 stitches, including those chains. But here on our little swatch, of course, we've just got a few. Um, Renee, were there any questions I could answer right away here before we move on to row two? Nothing so far, good to go. Okay, great. So row two, because you'll remember, we want to stick with row A, or excuse me, color A for our first two rows in our stripe pattern. So row two, we're going to go ahead and continue with this color. We're going to chain one and turn, or turn and chain one, however you like to do it. And then single crochet right in that very first stitch. A little bit more yarn. The Ogo flows really beautifully um, when you've got the space to do it. Right here on my camera, I've just got a tiny little table space. So I have to pull it off by hand, but if you can set it a little farther away from you and actually pull this over in front of your lap, it flows off really beautifully. So now that I've got some more yarn pulled up, I can finish that single crochet right there in our first stitch. And then we need to work a single crochet in the next chain one space. So we come back and look at our work. Remember we chained one and skipped one. So that means we don't work into that chain. We're going to go into the space, the hole that's right there beneath the chain. So we just go right into that hole right there with our hook and make another single crochet. There we are. Then we can continue our repeat for row two. So this is the part that starts with the asterisk for row two. Same thing, chain one, skip the next stitch, and then single crochet in the next chain one space. So just as we were doing before, but now we're going to be crocheting into chain one spaces rather than, rather than chains. So we skip that next single crochet, come to that next space, insert our hook, and make our single crochet. Chain one, skip the next single crochet, single crochet in that next space. Chain one, skip the next single crochet, single crochet right in that space. Chain one again, skip the next single crochet, single crochet right in that chain space. Now that brings us, I need to pull up a little bit more yarn here, that brings us right to the end of our row. We've got one more stitch here. Just wanna pull up some more yarn. There we are. So as we come to the end of row two here, we've single crocheted in that last chain one space, and then we've got that last single crochet hanging out there on the end. So we need to put a single crochet right in there, but I'm not going to finish it. I'm going to go ahead, insert my yarn and pull up my loop for that stitch. But I want to finish that stitch with color B because we finished two rows and it's time to switch colors. So I'm gonna pull in my color B here, find a little place here. I think I'm gonna put this one in my lap right now, just so I've got a little bit more room to work. I'm gonna pull up some length here of this one and find my end. There we go, sorry about that. All right, so here is the end for this one. And I am going to pick my hook back up here, pull up this yarn, Simply yarn over with that new yarn, color B, and pull that loop through to finish the stitch. Now what I want to do is I want to go ahead and leave color A still attached. I don't wanna cut this. I don't wanna be weaving in 
you know, however many ends of yarn that would be, I want to go ahead and hold these, float these essentially along the sides. So we'll be demonstrating that here as we go. But now it's time to begin row three. So I'm gonna go ahead and chain one with our new color and turn and start row three. Renee, were there any questions on that before I continue? A um, little quiet, but I guess this is more of a tip. Um, mm -hmm. How do you stay consistent with the size of each stitch so the rows are even? Practice, honestly, mm -hmm. um, practice. Um, that is genuinely one of the biggest struggles I think every beginner has. Um, consistency of stitches and sizing and everything. Um, you, The size itself of the loop should be primarily determined by the hook. You know, you can see here how the hook determines the size of the loop. But everybody's tension is different. Everybody, you know, some people yank up on their stitches as they're making. Some people yank on their working yarn, which makes their stitches real short. Everyone's gauge is different. And that's why a lot of patterns, um, particularly garments and things that really do have to fit as opposed to a blanket, um, will have the gauge measurement included. I'm sure there's probably one, yes, right here for this pattern as well. Six stitches and six rows equals four inches right there. That's the gauge. The reason they need to list this on the pattern is because everyone's gauge is different. And when it is something that you need to make fit, the gauge needs to be close to the designer's gauge so that you can, you know, make the right size. But as you are learning to crochet, your personal gauge and tension level are going to be wonky because you're still learning those movements. You're going to be pulling up on one, pulling on the working yarn on the other. And so your stitches can end up uneven. Unfortunately, the best cure for that is simply practice. So wish I had a better like, oh, this is an easy fix tip, but just practice being consistent, um, getting used to holding the hook and um, yeah, practice, practice, practice. Sorry, wish I had an easier answer for that one. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing as well. <laughs> you get into a rhythm eventually. Yes, yes, you do, you do, absolutely. Um, you know, I think by the time, you know, you finished your, a few, few of those long scarves with the wonky edges, <laughs> yep, it starts yep. to even out for sure. So let's go ahead here and move on to row three. Um, the pattern link should be in the chat, and I'm sure they can drop that again here. Yep. So I've got a chain one. I'm going to single crochet in that first stitch again. There we are. And then we start our section with the asterisk already for this one. Chain one, skip the next single crochet, and single crochet in the next chain one space. So chain one, skip the next single crochet, single crochet right in that chain one space. You can really... Pull the yarn right apart there if you need to, to stick your hook right in there. And I did see somebody asking where to get the yarn. This yarn is available at your local Michaels and on yarnspiration.com. So I'm just doing the same thing. Chain one, skip the next stitch, single crochet in that chain one space. This part's pretty easy. Chain one, skip one, single crochet in the next chain one space. You can see why this is really such a favorite pattern for many crocheters. It's just quick, it's easy. You don't have to go into any fussy chains except for that very first row, and it really creates a great look. But here we are at the end of row three. I have chained one and skipped one. That brought us to that very last stitch. So we just want to go ahead and put a single crochet right in that very last stitch. So now we need to work across again with this color, two rows, of course, in each color, but rows two and three are, uh, are this is hard to say, are our basic repeat there we go so basically you just repeat those same two rows but you're changing colors every two rows so it's a little confusing because the repeat is split but as you continue to crochet this um you really do memorize the pattern very very quickly so let's go ahead and make row four here which is going to be a repeat of row two but i think you'll see how it comes together here we chain one turn always single crochet in that very first stitch and now, instead of looking at the instructions, let's go ahead and look at our pattern. Let's read our pattern, read what we've done, so we can see what we need to do next. What do we have next? We've single crocheted in the first stitch. The next thing we have available to us is a chain one space. So we're going to put a single crochet in it. So that means there's a stitch there. So we need to chain one and skip over it. Look for that next chain one space, put a single crochet in it. So now we're off and running. By looking at our stitches, we knew what we needed to do for this row. 
So we're just going to do the same thing across, chain one, skip one, single crochet in that chain one space until we get all the way here to the end. And then we can look at our end and say, okay, we single crocheted in that last chain one space, but now we've got one single crochet still there. We can't chain one and skip it. We need to work right into it. So we can go right into that stitch for the last stitch of row four, but because it's row four, it's time to switch colors again. So this is where we are going to pull up that other color. I stopped with the two loops on my hook again. And then I am going to sort out my ends here and find the end for color A. Now, lots of people have different ways that they like to do this, pulling up the uh, colors along the edge. This is simply the way I like to do it. I'm going to let color B, our pink yarn, just drop to the back. Just drop it right back there. Pick up my color A. Not worried about this end down here for the pink. I'm going to weave that in when it's all done. So I'm just going to pick that up, yarn over with it, and then really gently pull that up and through those two loops. And I want to do that really gently for a couple reasons. Um, basically, the main one being I want that this line here that I'm pulling along the side, this is the float. We're going to be floating these colors along this edge. These will get covered up by our edging or our border, so you don't have to worry about them. We just want them to be right here along the edge but we don't want them to be too tight. So as you pull that up, if I had been real tight with it, you can see how that would gather up the side there. It would make it all pinchy. It wouldn't be nice and flat and even along our sides. And if I had made it too loose, which now I have to loosen it up because it's too tight. There we are. If I'd made it really loose, then you're gonna have big loopy bits along the edge. A little bit easier to fix than the other problem if you've pulled it too tight, because that we can cover that up with a border, but we just want it to be really even. So I'm gonna pull this out so we can do that again. We get those two loops back on our hook here. So we're ready to, we've been crocheting with this one, we're ready to switch colors. We're just gonna drop that one to the back, grab our new one, yarn over with it, and gently, not even putting any tension on that working yarn, I'm just going to gently pull that on up and through. Now I'm going to give it a little wiggle, just back and forth, giving a little tension on each side, so that I can feel and see that it's laying really nicely there. It's not too loose, but it's not tight. It's not pulling down on that side either. So then I can go ahead and continue to crochet with color A. We're gonna be doing the same thing we were doing before, and we can do it again, reading our stitches. So let's chain one and turn, or turn and chain one. We always single crochet right back into that very first stitch. And then we look at our stitches. What do we have next? There's a single crochet right there. So we need to chain one and skip it. Find that next chain one space. And we're off and running with our repeat. So I will work on across here for our fifth row. And of course, if you're making the full size blanket, you'll have a whole lot more of these to make than our little swatch here. But this is a really fun pattern. Um, and if you feel like you want to practice this one before you get started on the actual blanket, I really love um, this stitch pattern. It's really great for things like dishcloths and washcloths. And you can always pick up a ball of Lily Sugar and Cream and give the stitch pattern a practice um, on a little swatch like this and then make a really cute washcloth that you can use later too. So we are almost at the end here. I had to stop and pull up some more yarn. I'm going to chain one and skip this one. We've got one single crochet right here on the end. So I need, I need, I know that I need to work right into that one. And I did see a great question come up. When you turn your work, do you always turn across the front, like turn a page in a book? And yes, I do. I'm right-handed. So to me, when I turn my work, I always turn it like I'm reading a book. If I were left-handed, I would have just worked this way across this row. And so I would probably turn my work this way. Whichever way you turn it, you do want to be consistent. That is the main thing. So if you prefer the look when you turn it the other direction, that's fine. It's your project. You can do it however you like, but you need to just be consistent. So I always turn my, my work just like I'm turning the page of a book. That way I always know I'm always going the same direction. If you flip it back and forth and as you go, you're not going to have the same look along the edges. Um, just one of those things that... Uh, can help you improve the look of your crochet. So that was a great question to ask. Thank you. So, alrighty, we've got our last stitch there. We know this is just our first row in this color, so we need to work another row in this color. Plus, we know that because our the end we need to use next is still hanging out over here. 
So let's go ahead and do that together, reading our stitches again. I've got my chain one, flip it over while we single crochet right in that very first stitch. Then we can look at our work. What do we have next? There's a chain one space, so we need to put a single crochet in there. Then we've got a stitch, so we're off and running. Chain one, skip that stitch, single crochet in the next chain one space. Now, as you crochet with two colors, I want to show you what's happening here. <laughs> you can see, we can see what's happening here. It's getting a little tangled. Basically, they're just getting wound around each other as you crochet. So every few rows, what I like to do is just untangle those really, really simply. Untwist them right there. And then they're separated again. Now, if you wanted to work just one color for this pattern, if you only wanted to use, you know, one skein of Oga, or well, you'd have to use more than one skein, but you know what I mean? If you wanna use just one color or one color way, then you don't have to worry about changing these colors and you're not gonna get the twisting. But if you, uh, you know, if you wanna do the, the stripes, that is what you need to do, is just basically give it a little untwist every once in a while. So now that my yarn's all straightened out, I can come back here and continue across, chain one, Skip one, single crochet in the next. Oops, chain one, skip one, single crochet in the next. Chain one, skip one, single crochet in the next. And then I can see we're right here at the end. And what do I have? Just one single crochet. So I'm gonna go ahead and put my single crochet right in that last stitch. But I'm working into the same color here. That means it's time to change colors. So. Now we need to pull up the other color. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm just going to drop this one behind. Take the time, get my ends all sorted out here. There we are. You can go ahead and weave in that one early if you want to. Make sure I've got a little bit of yarn pulled up for this color. Oop. There we go. And now we can do that. So I was finishing that stitch. I'm going to drop that color. Pull up the old color. Just pull it right on up over my hook. And same thing, I want to really gently pull that color on through to start our next row. So now if we turn it over, you can see how that's looking there. Those are those floats along the side. They're just getting pulled right along the side of our work. So when we go to put our border on and we're crocheting into the sides of those stitches, we'll want to make sure to capture those inside those border stitches. Just crochet right over those floats along the edge and they'll just disappear and they'll be totally hidden by our border. Let me get my <laughs> swatch all straightened back out here. All right, there we are. So basically, that's it. This is the essentials of the moss stitch pattern. You can chain one, keep going, keep making rows, changing colors every two rows. Um, when you weave in your ends, great question, Tracy. I would actually, I would be very careful um, to definitely, I would take my time and weave in the pink into the pink stitches, I would weave in my blue end into the blue stitches, whatever is nearby that matches, it's going to hide those ends a whole lot better. So we come back to our written pattern here. Yes, I am going to show a border. Um, that's actually what we're getting to right now. Thank you, Lindsay. So if we come back to our pattern here, you can see we've just re repeat, repeat rows two and three right here until the blanket measure is about 60 inches long. So again, that's the written pattern using three ogos of each color. If you want to make your own size blanket, you can keep going or stop as soon as you're done. But what you want to do, it says, is end on a wrong side row. So looking at our pattern, trying to find where it says which one is the wrong size. It doesn't really um, define right side, wrong side. So in this case, judging by what we've been doing, I'm going to say that most likely our wrong side row is just after a second one, you know, a second, a second row of the, the same color. After you've finished your repeat, basically, you've made two rows of that last color you want to use. So now we can go ahead and move on to our edging. That's what we're going to do on our little swatch. You would do it after you've reached 60 inches and you've made those two rows there with that last color. So for our edging, what we want to do is continue with whatever color you were on and chain one. 
Then what we're going to do is we're going to single crochet evenly along around the outer edge of the blanket with three single crochets in each corner. So this is just sort of our first round of edging. We're going to have two rounds of edging for this pattern. So because I'm going to be using this color for our edging, I'm going to go ahead and cut off the blue one here just so that my yarn is a little easier to manage here on my table. So, and of course, if you're making the full size blanket, you can go ahead and just go with the one you're going to be using for the border at this point as well. So let me find that end here. I want to make sure that I do leave a good six inches or so for weaving in those ends. Let me set that yarn aside. All right. And then we'll come back over here and get started on that border. Let me get the swatch here straightened out. There we go. Okay. So I've got my chain one. And the first thing we're going to do is just single crochet evenly across the top row. So same thing. We go into that first stitch. Now we're going to go, we've got a single crochet there. So we want a single crochet right in there. Now we've got a chain one space. So we would single crochet in the chain one space. And then in the stitch. And then in the chain one space, you get the idea in each stitch and and each chain one space across. This part's pretty, pretty self-explanatory, I think. And then when we get to the corner, that's where we need to put the three stitches in the corner so that we can turn the corner. Hopefully we'll get to the weave in ends part. We'll see how time goes here. There we are. So we're at, we've worked our way across. I know that's that last stitch. So this is where we want to put those three single crochets because that's what's going to take us around the corner. So in that last stitch, we put one, go right in there again for a second. And then you can go right in there again for a third. And you can see what that did by putting three stitches in that one stitch, it really pushed those around the edge. So now we're set up to crochet down along the side here. Now crocheting into the side of moss stitch can be a little tricky. So it's okay if you make a few stitches and you say, I don't like that, and you pull it back out and make it again. We do want to take the time and look. This is not our edge with our floats. That's the other edge. So we don't need to worry about those for this edge. So for now, what you want to do is kind of just find the side of each row as best you can. We've already worked around that side of our first row. So I'm going to come down here to the side of our second row. And what I like to do is try and insert my hook under two two basically two yarns two uh strands that's the word i was looking for two strands of yarn whatever i can find there right along the edge so i've got two right there yarn over pull my loop through and make my single crochet then i'll come down here find that next row find two strands right along the side there insert my hook and yarn over and make a single crochet Find the next row, same thing. There we are. Now I've just got two rows left here. So I know I need two rows, two more rather along the side here. So there's one. Gotta find those two strands. Just got one here. So let me try that again. With this big thick yarn, it can be tempting to just go with one. But if you always stick with two, you're most likely going to get a more even looking border. There we go. So that's looking pretty good. I always like to go back and check and make sure it's not it's not too tight. I need, don't need to add more stitches. If it's rippling, it might have too many stitches. But if it's nice and flat, then we're in the Goldilocks zone. So now we can come down right here. You can see we've got one more row here, basically that first row we made. And it's a little wonky because we've got our chain. So this is where we want to put those three stitches around the corner again. So sometimes I like to split these up. Sometimes I just put them all right in that bottom of that first chain. Let's go ahead and do the way we split it up. You can do it, try different ways and see what works best for you. I'm going to put one in the side of the row, I think right here. And then in that top of the stitch or basically the bottom of the stitch, the bottom of the foundation chain, I'll put the other two because we're at a corner and we need to put three in the corner. So I just sort of split it up a little bit to get it a little more even here as we work around this corner. There we are. So you can see how that sort of pushed me then around that corner. So if you want to put all three in that corner, you can. You can try it different ways, see what looks best to you. 
I always say working to the edges is just as much art as it is science, if not more so. Pull up a little bit more yarn here from our skein. And now we need to address this foundation chain. Now we worked into these foundation chains. We're looking at the chain upside down right now, but we're going to treat it just as if it was regular stitches. We've got a what looks like a chain one space here. So we'll just single crochet right in that chain one space. We have the bottom of a single crochet. So we'll just single crochet right in there. If you worked under the top two loops of your chain, then you may just have one loop there at the bottom of the stitch to work into, but that's okay. I've got two because I worked into that bottom one, but if you've just got the one, that's what you should work into. And then of course, into the chain one space, then to the bottom of that next stitch, and the chain one space, and the bottom of the next stitch, and the chain one space. And now we are at the end of our little swatch again. You can see right there, it's that very first stitch we made back when we started this project after we made all our chains there, that was that first single crochet. So again, we're gonna go into the bottom of this one and it's a corner, so we want to put a couple in there. We could put all three in there if we wanted to, or we can put it one in the side. I'm gonna go ahead and put the third one right in there. Again, then you can compare and contrast and see. It's one of the reasons it's great to make a swatch before you start a whole project, just to see which edges you like best. And then we need to work our way up this edge, but this is the edge with our floats. So this is where we wanna pay particular attention. Now you could go ahead and weave in your ends now. I'm going to go ahead and weave them in later. So I'm just going to ignore them for now. I'm just gonna let them hang out on my project. It's these floats right here. We only changed colors a couple times on our little swatch. So I only have two of them on the full size blanket. You'd have these floats running all the way up the side. So as we work our way down this side, we want to make sure to capture these inside our stitches. So that's what I'm gonna do now. I don't have one up here, so I'm just gonna go ahead and go right into the side of this stitch and make my single crochet there. Oop, drop my hook. There we go. And then this is where we need to really take our time. So I've got a blue row to work into the side of, and I'm just going to push that float right up to the top of the side there so that when I go under into that stitch, you can see that float is now on top of my hook as well. So I've got the float on top of my hook. Then I'm going to take my time back here and find my loop that I or loops that I want to go under. There we go. And then when I yarn over and make that single crochet, that float is captured and then hidden right inside. So I'll finish that up. You can see now it's inside. It's hidden in there. It's not going to catch on anything. It's going to disappear. So we need to do that again when we come down here to the next row. I just want to make sure that floats on top of our hook as we go to the make that stitch and enclose it right in that stitch, just like that. All goes away. Same thing, we come down to this pink float. We need to make sure to get on top of our hook as we go in to the side of that row. Make that stitch. And you can see how that border really does just cover those floats right up. You might have a little pop of color, peep of color, but we're doing lots of color changes in this pattern, so you're going to see those anyway. And then, of course, just continue that on down as we work into those edges. There's that pink float up top, and I can make sure I crochet right over it. There we are. So this is one of the ways that we can use borders to really make crocheting a little bit more fun, avoiding having to weave in extra ends by floating those edges along the side. So I'm coming down here along the bottom. I want to move that end out, take another look at it and see here. Looks like I've got one more row to work into before we hit this corner. So again, I'm just going to make sure that float gets caught in there, although it's probably fine at this point. I don't think it's going anywhere. And then we are down at our first stitch. Now, this is the very first stitch I made for this first round. So that's one of the stitches in the three at this corner, if you will. So I've got one stitch there. I've got the stitch I started the whole round out with. So I'm just going to go ahead and put one more in this corner. So that plus those two plus the one that I started with make the three that gets me around that final corner. So what we do when we come to the end of this first round of our edging is we're going to slip stitch the first single crochet we made. So simply insert your hook right in there. 
yarn over and pull that loop right on through. And we can go ahead and make that tight. We're not going to be crocheting back into that slip stitch at all. So this is basically on a very small scale what it should look like after the first round of the edging. So now what we're going to do is our second round of edging. You can see right here. And this is a really unusual stitch. It's called the reverse single crochet. It's also known as the crab stitch. Um, it's a lot of fun and it really creates a really great textured edging. But one of the interesting things is, and this is written for a right-hander, working from left to right, work one reverse single crochet in each stitch around. So this stitch actually moves the opposite direction. So if you're left-handed, you'll be going, um, normally you would be going right to left, or normally you'd, be going, normally you'd be going left to right, you'd be going right to left, basically the opposite direction. However, you normally crochet, you need to go the opposite, opposite direction for this stitch. So let me pull up a little more yarn for my skein and we will get started on some reverse single crochet. All righty. So we want to reverse single crochet in each stitch around. Simply single crochet. Might want to put an extra one in maybe in that center corner stitch if, you, if your quarter gets a little tight, but this is how it goes. We're going to chain one. And then, because I'm right-handed, normally I would start crocheting, you know, often that direction. <laughs> now I need to go in that direction. So this is my slip stitch. I don't want to work into that. This was the top of my last stitch. I'm going to insert my hook. Get that good and centered there. Got the yarn on my hook. I'm going to insert my hook into that stitch behind. Keep your yarn, wrap it right over the top there, yarn over. Pull that loop up and three, through, and then finish it. Yarn over and finish your single crochet. We'll do that again. Don't worry, we're gonna do that a whole bunch. Find the next stitch right there, right in front of your work. You're just gonna move your hook back. It can feel really awkward and that's okay. Insert your hook right through that loop. Now we wanna make sure, this is part of the tricky part of this stitch. We wanna make sure to bring our Yarn right over here so that we can yarn over with it. We don't want to accidentally yarn under and pull it over. We want to kind of keep it in front of our hook so we can just grab it and pull it up and through. So we've got two loops on our hook. We'll separate those so it's a little easier to see right there. And then finish our single crochet. So let's do it again because this is the sort of stitch that really it looks is particularly wonky until you get a few of them made and then they sort of straighten out. Find the next stitch with your hook, go right in front of your work. Insert your hook right in that stitch. Bring the working yarn up and over. Grab it with your hook. Pull it up and through. Yarn over and pull through too. Now let's take a quick break and look what that looks like. That creates this really great sort of textured, rolled, almost pepperminty type of look. It's kind of hard to see in this color. Let me pull up our finished blanket here from my lap and see if we can get a little bit better look at it here with some other colors. This has got an end woven in, so it's a little easier to actually see right there. But here you can see some of that texture you get by working this technique. This is that finished reverse single crochet edging. So let's take a couple more of those and then I want to show you an alternative that I really love. So a couple more reverse single crochets, just so we can get the hang of it. We're gonna find that next stitch right there. Remember, we're going the opposite direction from where we're used to going. Put the hook right in front of it. And just stick it right through that stitch. Bring the yarn up and over. Don't let it come over here or over here and get twisted. You wanna just bring it straight over. Use your hook to grab it. Pull it up through that stitch. So now we've got two loops on the hook and yarn over and pull through those two loops. And I always find that with this stitch, sometimes it helps if it's starting to look a little funny, just give it a little little hand blocking, a little, a little tug, a little zhuzh, and it straightens right out and it gives you that really, really pretty look. Now, this is the standard way to do reverse single crochet, AKA the crab stitch, and it's a great edging stitch to know. It really gives us great, great border. However, there is an alternative called the twisted single crochet that I'd like to show you today because I think it's a lot of fun and I think it's a little bit easier than the reverse single crochet, but you might 
You might prefer the reverse single crochet and that's okay too. But let me show you my favorite little edging trick here, the twisted single crochet. I'm still gonna start with a chain one. And instead of going, you know, the opposite direction we're used to, we're going to go the same direction we're used to. So I'll go into that first stitch. I'm gonna insert my hook and yarn over and pull up my loop. And now I'm going to spin my hook all the way around. Then yarn over and pull through. Let's do that again. We go to the next stitch, insert our hook, yarn over and pull up a loop. Make sure these loops are up nice and high. Now we're going to spin our whole hook again, all the way around, then yarn over and pull through to finish the stitch. We'll do a couple more and you can see how that looks just like the other one. We want to do a couple to get a good look at it. Go into the next stitch, yarn over and pull up our loop. Give them a give them a little extra room. We've got that got to spin our hook in there. It's going to take up a little bit of yarn. Spin the hook all the way around. Yarn over. And pull through those two loops. Now, let me put my hook somewhere where it's not going to try and roll away on me here. There we go. And now we can look at what that looks like. Very, very similar, right? Let me pull up our actual finished blanket here. Very similar look. Same texture, little different way of making it. So you guys let me know. Let me know in the chat which way, which way. This is called twisted single crochet is what I've been doing. This is reverse single crochet or the crab stitch. Very similar looks, nearly identical. Two different techniques to get the same thing. So if you love the reverse single crochet, or aka the crab stitch, absolutely do that. It's a wonderful stitch to know and edging. But you can get a very, very similar look with a little different technique, that twisted single crochet. Um, it's just, like I say, it gives you a different look. It's a little fun. I really love it. And I think it's a little bit easier to do. But that gives us, um, if you spin from the front or back, it will change the direction of the twist. So I'm right-handed, so I go, this would be counterclockwise. If I were left-handed, I would probably go clockwise, but that would take a little bit of experimentation. And I'm not ambidextrous enough to test it out for myself to be honest um but you do always when you start doing it you want to always spin your direction spin your hook the same direction um as you go but that said it's crochet and that's the fun of it play with it try spinning it the other direction see if you like that look better um try mixing it up you know it's fun it's just yarn and if you don't like it you can always just pull it on out right so let's talk now about weaving in ends we've got a few minutes left here and i saw quite a few questions come up about that so I'm going to go ahead and say I'm done with my little swatch here. I've made my my little hand pad <laughs> and I'm going to go ahead and cut my yarn. When I cut my yarn, I always like to leave at least six inches. If it's a really thick jumbo yarn um, like Bernat Blanket Big, I'll leave even more because I want to make sure that I have enough end to weave in. So when you're weaving in these ends, you'll want to go ahead and use a yarn needle of some kind. And before I finish that off, actually, I need to pull that yarn end through. When you finish this edging all the way around, however you want to do it, you still want to join or go ahead and slip stitch however you want to join to your first stitch of the round and then finish that off. Almost forgot to do that part. And then you can weave in your ends. So you need a yarn needle of some kind. And um, if you don't have one yet, you can use your hook to do this, but it's a lot easier if you get a hold of a yarn needle. Basically, a yarn needle is a lot like a sewing needle but it's got a much bigger hole there at the top. Makes sense, right? Not thread, but yarn. This is some really thick yarn. If you work with even thicker yarns, you um, can pick up things called finishing needles by Susan Bates that are even easier to use with jumbo yarns, but this one should fit right in the top there. So one thing I like to do if I struggle a little bit getting my yarn on the yarn needle, just a little tip here, is I will fold it over and pull that yarn needle out before I put it in. And that seems to create just Let's see, here we are. It's just a little bit easier for me. You don't have that weird edge to try and get through the yarn needle, but however it works for you. So got my yarn on the needle. So now I'm going to weave in my ends. Now, I do want to go ahead and weave this blue end into the blue yarn. We wanna match the color as much as possible. If you're working something, you know, once you get going with these big long 
rows, you're going to have lots of color changes, but you should still have at least a little bit of that color to help you weave your end in right there uh, near where your end got cut off. So basically to weave in our ends with this yarn, we're just going to take our yarn needle and get a really good view here and start going in between the stitches. We want to hide the needle inside those stitches as much as possible. So I will put my yarn needle in and I will even check the other side and make sure that it's not just sticking out the other side because then it's not very well hidden. But we go one direction, just pull that yarn on through. There we are. And we don't want to pull super tight because the same thing can happen that happened with those floats. If we pull super tight, our work is going to get all squinched together and we don't want that. We just want it to lay really nicely along those stitches. Then, and this is the really important part, we need to go a couple different directions. We want to head in an opposite direction at least once to really lock that in. If we just went the same direction or if we just crocheted over those edges, then as we use and wear and want, well, we don't, I don't know if we wear our blankets, although I guess I have been wearing a blanket lately in the cold. Um, as we wash our blankets, um, we don't want that end to work back out. This is a pretty textured yarn, so it's unlikely that it would, but we just, we don't want to do all that work to have our ends come back out when we're all done. So it's really important to go the opposite direction as well. And with some yarns, this one you cannot, but with some yarns that are more spun or plied, if you will, you can actually get inside the yarn with the yarn needle as you go the different directions. That can really help lock it in. But this yarn is constructed a little differently, so we don't have that option for this one. You can see there, I'm just going to gently pull, and then I always like to give a little tug to my fabric to make sure that I haven't pulled too tight, that I'm not squinching up my fabric and look at it and make sure it's not too loose. There's nothing sticking up. I can't actually see where that end was woven in there. And then maybe one more time back in that first direction again, just to really lock it in and just try. And it's kind of hard to uh, show something that's hidden when you're telling people to hide it, but you really just want to bury that needle in there as much as possible. So that means your yarn end then will be hidden as much as possible. So after we pull that yarn end all the way through and see I've worked almost all of my six inches in there. You don't have to get all of it and go ahead and put my yarn needle down and then get my scissors ready. And here's the little trick. What you want to do is put a little bit of tension on this end. Pull it out just a little bit. Squinch that fabric up just a hair. Then very carefully cut off that end close to your fabric. And then when we give it a little tug, that end will disappear right back inside. All gone. All gone. And so that was our first end. And then we've continued to do that with our other ones. For some reason, this one came with a little knot right on the end. So I'm going to right at the end of the yarn. So I'm going to cut that one off before I weave in my end. But that is how I like to weave in my ends. Um, you don't have to go crazy, you know, weaving them in for miles and miles. But the really important thing is to just make sure that you work back in that opposite direction. Um, at least a couple times that will really help lock it in. And as I say, if you've got applied yarn where it's a little more wound, you can actually get the needle right inside the yarn itself as you come back, and that will extra help lock it in. So for this one, we've got a couple options here. This is also our border color. So I can just do it right along the border, like so, and then maybe go into the fabric a little bit this direction. Get it buried in this way. Oop, pull that through again. Just give it a little. That one pulled a little hard, so I want to make sure it's not too tight there. And then just come back that other direction. There we are. And that one should be done right there. So same thing. I'll show you that one more time here. Might be easier to see on this lighter color, too. We want to just give that a little tug. So it comes up a little bit from where we've woven it in. Trim it off nice and close. And then when we give a little tug back to our fabric and straighten it back out, the end just disappears right into the fabric of our blanket. So we've got five minutes left, Renee. Are there any questions I can answer here? Um, there's a lot of compliments for you that I can read out if you Ooh. would like. Well, thank you. <laughs> so, yes, let's do the last five minutes all about me. Now, um, <laughs> it's a little self-serving, but uh, <laughs> if they, I don't know if there's any questions or anything I can answer about it. It is just such a great pattern. Um, that's what it looks like there. 
all finished a little easier to see. Um, so, Absolutely. okay. One thing um, that did come up a little bit earlier. So mm -hmm. say you wanted to just go with a regular burnout blanket, so not in the OGO format. Sure. How would you go about altering this pattern? Would that change your color work a little bit? Um, you know, it depends. There's so, it's a great question, but there's so many OGOs out there that you could choose from, or excuse me, so many burnout blankets, I should say, um, and other yarns. There's the variegated, there's, you know, the ones with different colorways and things. Um, you, to make this pattern all in with one skein, if you will, whatever that skein looks like, the main thing is you just simply wouldn't have to change colors every two rows. You simply chain one and keep going back and forth in rows like we were doing before without having to do stop with those two loops on the hook and pull through the new color. You wouldn't have floats to uh, have to cover up when you make your border. So if you are a beginner and you you know feel like the color changes are just a little bit too much, this is absolutely a great pattern to make all in one color. Um, or I should say all with one skein or one colorway or however you want to describe it. I think it'd be a lot of fun in a variegated. And like I say, it's also a great one to practice. Um, grab that skein of Lily Sugar and Cream at the same time. You can whip up a few washcloths while you master these stitches, and then you'll have something um, pretty and useful uh, before you get started on your full blanket, before you can build up that confidence. So here's a little closer look at the finished blanket, and there's that border. You can see Sometimes when you work that crab stitch or re twisted single crochet border, it said one to one, but you might want to throw an extra one in the corner if it feels a little squinchy right there. Totally up to you. But I think that should cover it. So I think we can probably go ahead and come back to the other camera. If that's all right. Um, for washcloths, great question, Kay. I love using Lily Sugar and Cream um, or Burnett Handicrafter, both great options. Um, I think 100% cotton. That's the main thing for washcloths. I really, I just think, I always talk about washcloths. I know it seems like a silly thing, but they are such a great way to learn new stitches, to try out new stitches, to practice a stitch pattern before you use the good yarn on it, you know? Um, I mean, no, that those aren't good yarns, but, you know, you don't want to break into necessarily the big yarn for your big project. Um, if you want to take some practice time making a washcloth with Lily Sugar and Cream, Burnett Handicrafter, like I say, both great options. Um, and then you have something pretty that you have finished before you've started your full project and it gets, lets you get those um, stitches a little bit more even and gives you a little more familiarity with it. So anything else I can answer? Oh, no, I think we're good. Um, okay. I definitely want to echo that sentiment. It is really great to kind of swatch and test mm -hmm. things out on different types of yarns, particularly a bit more of like a casual yarn before you break yes. out, you know, your big luxurious blanket. So absolutely. absolutely practice on all kinds of things. Yes, yes. Grab grab the Red Heart Super Saver, you know, the little odds and ends you've got on your stash. You can you can practice with just about anything. And honestly, some people really love Red Heart Super Saver as a washcloth too, because then it's real scrubby. But uh, yep, so that's what it looks like. And we have one minute left. Any last minute questions? <laughs> <laughs> Um, just compliments, which I will read to you later. All right. I think we're good. Um, everyone, this class will be available by recording. I think uh, Milan said after 24 hours, so mm -hmm. you can come and, you know, get brushed up and it'll be great. Yes. And, and I can... always recommend too, if I've gone a little too fast for you, which I understand can happen, um, you know, this is a great thing about YouTube. Not only can you pause, but look for that little gear icon and you can also slow down or speed up the uh, video as needed. I know I do it all the time when I watch tutorials too. So thank you so much for joining us and I hope you have a great day, everybody. Awesome. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye. Happy holidays. Bye.